extreme weather slides. You've all seen the images of Katrina and Sandy and the California wildfires and most recently the fires in Alberta and then going on to the effects in the global south, which of course are traditionally much more extreme. Uh, the fires, for example, the, the droughts, for example, in the Horn of Africa and flooding in Pakistan several years ago and the unprecedented typhoons in places like the Philippines and Fiji. And many of you saw the news that uh, Rajasthan, the desert part of India, just had a day for the first time where the temperature reached 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Many places in the Middle East and South Asia were literally looking at scenarios, and we'll look at a little more about it, I'll look at it a little bit more in a minute, where um, daily temperatures on a regular basis will be hotter than what human perspiration can physically adapt to. We're talking about conditions where it's literally going to be unsafe for people to be working outside during the summer in many parts of the world. Um, this is the, <coughs> uh, the NOAA map, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, for calendar year 2015. Worldwide record heat, as you all know. Um, the blue areas are the two places that were uniquely cooler than normal, of course, directly adjacent to the two places in the world where major glaciers are, are melting the fastest. And cool weather in the Northeast, like last winter, uh, not this most recent winter, of course, but the winter before is strongly correlated to that pocket of, of cold air related to glacial melting off of Greenland. We've been through 30 years without a single month uh, below historical averages, um, and the extent to which current temperatures exceed the norms uh, is increasing very rapidly. We're seeing month after month of uh, between one and a half, well, between one and one and a half degrees above normal. The kinds of scenarios people were projecting for 20 years, 50 years in the future are things we're, we're starting to see right now. Um, most of, uh, most of capital is not especially interested, but the insurance industry certainly is. This is from uh, Munich Reinsurance from a couple of years ago, looking at trends in uh, catastrophic events. And of course, the red category are geophysical events that aren't climate related, and that's relatively flat, but everything else is, is sloping up very rapidly. Munich Reinsurance? Munich Reinsurance. Um, this is from the IPCC, just to remind you of the scenarios that they're projecting for mid-century and uh, end of the century. Uh, I won't go into any detail about them except the top are uh, <coughs> temperature projections, precipitation, uh, Arctic ice, and ocean acidity, and the scenarios are, are very severe. Um, there's a whole discourse now around projection, uh, around attribution of extreme weather events to climate. We know that there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, which explains about 5 to 10 percent of uh, increased volatility and, uh, and storm conditions. Uh, we know that what we're seeing closely matches the projections of various models. Uh, what James Hansen calls the loading of the dice in favor of increasingly extreme weather. And we know that the science of direct attribution of the, the climate uh, component of specific weather events, uh, which is a field of study that barely existed at all uh, eight or ten years ago, uh, since a key paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2011 has become a, an increasingly important area of focus and studies that used to take 10 years to try to tease out the climate component of specific weather events are now being done much more routinely. Um, this is an interesting study that I always point to that I think gives us a more kind of visceral sense of, of where we're headed than the 
the general IPCC numbers. This is a study from University of Washington and Stanford in 2009. This was in response to the European heat wave that killed tens of thousands of people in 2003. They asked the question, how often in the future will average summer temperature be comparable to today's warmest temperature? So if the typical hottest day in New York City in the summer is 100 or 105 degrees, what's the likelihood that that will be a typical summer temperature in uh, mid-century and at the end of the century? And the percentages shown by the colors are the percentage of models. And remember, the way climate science is done now is not relying on individual models getting it right. The, the way climate science is done now relies on running hundreds or thousands of models using a spectrum of different assumptions and looking at the likelihood of, of various outcomes. So we see between 90 and 100 percent likelihood uh, at end of century given current trends of, and again, most severely in Central Africa and South Asia, which are already the places that are getting hit the hardest, of future average summer temperatures being comparable to today's most extreme. So this is one set of projections of the consequences of the agreements that were signed with much fanfare coming out of the Paris Agreement. And I'll get into some more of the particulars uh, in a little while. But just looking at raw numbers in terms of the trajectory of various scenarios, the red curve on top is business as usual, taking us well into the four to six degrees Celsius extreme out of control uh, climate meltdown. Uh, the blue line is a two degree path, and remember that two degrees, where it's, while it's described by the diplomats as a goal, as a quote unquote safe level, the scientists describe two degrees as the 50-50 point. Two degrees is the point at which there's 50% likelihood of constraining uh, climate change from spinning completely out of control into a, a chaotic and unpredictable mode. So two degrees isn't a safe scenario. And that's why the Paris Agreement, under pressure from global civil society, paid some lip service. And we'll, say, we'll see why I say lip service in just a minute to keeping warming to one, per, one and a half degrees, one and a half degrees over pre-industrial levels, and we're approaching that point much more quickly than anybody anticipated even five years ago. The curve in the middle uh, is the projected outcome of the various pledges that countries put forward in Paris that are enshrined in the agreement that just got signed. And that's a three and a half degree scenario if all of those uh, so-called pledges, and they're not even called pledges anymore, I'll get into that in a bit, um, are fully realized. And that's a, a big question because there's nothing legally binding or enforceable in, in those agreements. So since about 2007, there have been major mobilizations of global civil society at the various UN meetings. This is Bali, Indonesia in 2007, which is where the network uh, called Climate Justice Now first came together and articulated a program of uh, reducing consumption in the north, wealthy countries paying climate debts, leave fossil fuels in the ground, land and resource conservation oriented toward protecting indigenous land rights and sovereignty, and also a focus on sustainable agriculture and food sovereignty. That network was formed in 2007, and you can see the range of, of some of the issues that were articulated on the streets uh, outside that event. Uh, this was Copenhagen in 2009, uh, which at the time was by far the largest uh, international uh, 
mobilization of people urging that something be done about the climate. There were high expectations going into Copenhagen <coughs> that something definitive would be done coming off of the uh, end of the first implementation phase of the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, as we know, what happened instead in Copenhagen was uh, the effort by Obama and Hillary Clinton to bring in this new model of countries making voluntary pledges to reduce emissions uh, as an alternative to globally agreed upon emissions reductions. And what we've seen since then is really the playing out of uh, the scenarios that were really first put in place in Copenhagen. Uh, this is a couple of years later in Cancun in Mexico where the uh, marches outside the climate talks were led by Via Campesina. Uh, this is Durban, South Africa in 2011, which was the year that the focus on voluntary, they changed it from pledges to contributions, and then a few countries, including the US, said that, uh, to, I'm sorry, from pledges to commitments, and a few countries, including the US, decided that commitments was too strong a statement, and now they're called contributions that each country is bringing to the table. And Durban is where um, that approach was really enshrined in, uh, in, in the UN process. Uh, and this, of course, was Paris. And we'll be hearing a lot more from Sanoa about what was going on in the streets in Paris during the climate talks. This was on the, the last day of the Paris talks. Uh, and throughout Europe, and especially in France, in the whole period of six months leading up to it, there were various festivals of alternatives around Europe. And Alternativa is actually the, I understand, as I understand it, the French Basque term that became the slogan of, uh, of, of a lot of those events. And this was in Boston on that same day, the last day of the uh, Paris talks. About a thousand of us gathered in Boston for a big rally and march on the theme of jobs, justice, and climate, of course, following on uh, some of the big mobilizations involving a lot of unions that had been happening in, uh, in Canada over the past year. And this is just a rundown. I don't really have time to get into it in any detail uh, about the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have the scientists saying that it was bullshit. We have the preamble uh, making a lot of positive gestures in the right direction, including 1.5 degrees, including gender equity and the needs of indigenous peoples and the integrity of ecosystems, and even noting the importance for some of the concept of, quote, climate justice, which is how it's written. And then we have the working agreement, nationally determined voluntary contributions, a lot of rhetoric that we would agree with, but in terms of implementation, nothing more than a mechanism to facilitate implementation by an expert-based committee that is to be transparent, non-adversarial, and non-punitive. I think that's really key. Emissions peak as soon as possible, whatever that means. Focus on future carbon sources and sinks, which of course reopens uh, what began in Kyoto, push for carbon offsets various dubious carbon capture schemes and potentially geoengineering, and absolutely no kind of liability or compensation for people who have already incurred significant losses and damages. And that was also a major push by Todd Stern, the US uh, lead delegate in Paris, insisting that the whole loss and damage discussion, which has been a major focus for two years, basically be, be thrown out the door. Um, the, the key to, in my view, to the, okay, the key to the future of this movement is mobilizations around the world uh, focused on specific energy technologies and sources, uh, following the lead of huge mobilizations in coal country over many years. This is Richmond, California, around the big uh, Chevron refinery in Richmond, one of the first big climate justice mobilizations. People are familiar with the uh, campaign against the Keystone XL, what's best known were the actions in DC around the White House, but mo most importantly in my view were the efforts of the, the tar sands blockade working in Texas and Oklahoma. 
movements against fracking all over the world. This is in the UK. People might be familiar with the kayak actions, which we'll see more of in a bit. This was against uh, Shell's drilling rig in Seattle last summer. There was also one in Portland. This is Germany last year. We'll see even more impressive footage from Tazio about what happened in Germany. This year, this was, this was based at the most notorious uh, coal extraction site in Germany. Uh, about a year ago. Of course, people remember the climate march here in New York. And the following day, the action to shut down Wall Street, and then a few months later, on the, in front of the San Francisco Stock Exchange, flood Wall Street West. Uh, all over the country, this is in front of the State House, and in Vermont, focus on no new fossil fuel infrastructure. And people fighting various projects at public meetings and marches really taking an increasingly global <coughs> outlook focused on here on decolonization. And this is just last weekend in Albany, which hopefully some of you were also at. It was one of the really impressive coming together of climate activists from all around the Northeast and the, the local communities that live closest to where the trains carrying oil from North Dakota are constantly uh, traveling down the west side of Lake Champlain, unloading onto barges in the port of Albany. And this is going to be an ongoing effort in solidarity with the people who live right there, who are breathing uh, the muck that comes out of that facility every day. And people sat on the tracks until midnight uh, in pretty large numbers. There was also another action where one of the trains that got diverted to another route got blocked by a couple of climbers. Uh, and there were actions all around the world that day. This is in Australia, uh, focused on the world's biggest coal port. This is in Brazil, uh, Ogoniland in Nigeria, and South Africa. And I just want to end with some brief thoughts about the <coughs> elements that give our movement some of the, the strength and integrity and character that it has and some questions that we're facing for the future. Uh, certainly the synthesis of blockadia, folks mobilizing against particular, especially the most extreme energy technologies, a term that Naomi Klein popularized, but was really coined by the tar sands blockade folks in Texas, uh, focusing on a justice-centered outlook, uh, taking leadership from the most affected communities, plus an explicit anti-capitalism that comes to us from folks working under the banner of climate justice mainly in Europe and of course also the International Rising Tide Network, uh, tying together issues of race and class and indigenous rights. Uh, the idea that, grass, that policy changes need to be driven by mobilizations at the grassroots, not by the actions of people working behind the scenes in various policy, policy circles. Uh, the long-range vision of achieving a high quality of life with much lower levels of consumption, especially energy consumption. We know we have the technology to make that possible but uh, there are a lot of especially political obstacles and the growth imperative of capitalism makes that very difficult to realize under the current political context. Uh, ideas of energy democracy, especially community control of renewable energy in Vermont, we're having big fights against corporate uh, driven major renewable projects in uh, areas that, are, uh, that have uniquely important habitat, high levels of biodiversity, people are starting to get concerned about some of these projects. And the alternative, as we've seen in Europe and other places, is to really move toward projects that are genuinely community controlled. And then we need a long range vision for a completely different economic system and a gener genuinely liberated society. And there are many questions that you can read that the, the movement has yet to fully address. And these are the questions uh, that we continue to struggle with and that I hope we'll have some time to discuss uh, before we wrap up this morning. Thank you.